Chapter 3 How Did He Begin? There can be no doubt that the captains of industry today, using that term in its broadest sense, are men who began life as poor boys. Seth Lowe Poverty is very terrible, and sometimes kills the very soul within us. But it is the north wind that lashes men into Vikings. It is the soft, luscious south wind which lulls them to lotus dreams. Eden. Tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder. Shakespeare. Fifty years ago, said Hezekiah Conant, the millionaire manufacturer and philanthropist of Pawtucket, Rhode Island, I persuaded my father to let me leave my home in Dudley, Massachusetts, and strike out for myself. So one morning in May 1845, the old farm horse and wagon was hitched up, and dressed in our Sunday clothes, father and I started for Wooster. Our object was to get me the situation offered by an advertisement in the Wooster County Gazette, as follows. Boy wanted. Wanted immediately. At the Gazette office, a well-disposed boy, able to do heavy rolling. Wooster, May 7. The financial inducements were $30 the first year, $35 the next and $40 the third year and board in the employer's family. These conditions were accepted, and I began work the next day. The Gazette was an ordinary four-page sheet. I soon learned what, quote, heavy rolling, unquote, meant for the paper was printed on a Washington hand press, the edition of about 2,000 copies, requiring two laborious intervals of about 10 hours each every week. The printing of the outside was generally done Friday and kept me very busy all day. The inside went to press about 3 or 4 o'clock Tuesday afternoon, and it was after 3 o'clock on Wednesday morning before I could go to bed, tired and lame from the heavy rolling. In addition, I also had the laborious task of carrying a quantity of water from the pump behind the block around to the entrance in front and then up two flights of stairs, usually a daily job. I was at first everybody's servant. I was abused, called all sorts of nicknames, had to sweep out the office, build fires in winter, run errands, post bills, carry papers, wait on the editor. In fact, I led the life of a genuine printer's devil. But when I showed them at length that I had learned to set type and run the press, I got promoted, and another boy was hired to succeed in my task with all its decorations. That was my first success, and from that day to this I have never asked anybody to get me a job or situation, and never used a letter of recommendation. But when an important job was in prospect, the proposed employers were given all facilities to learn of my abilities and character. If some young men are easily discouraged, I hope they may gain encouragement and strength from my story. It is a long, rough road at first, but, like the ship on the ocean, you must lay your course for the place where you hope to land, and take advantage of all favoring circumstances. Don't go about the town any longer in that outlandish rig. Let me give you an order on the store. Dress up a little, Horace. Horace Greeley looked down on his clothes, as if he had never before noticed how seedy they were, and replied, You see, Mr. Starrett, my father is on a new place, and I want to help him all I can. He had spent but six dollars for personal expenses in seven months, and was to receive one hundred and thirty-five from Judge J. M. Starrett of the Erie Gazette for substitute work. He retained but fifteen dollars, and gave the rest to his father, with whom he had moved from Vermont to western Pennsylvania, and for whom he had camped out many a night to guard the sheep from wolves. He was nearly twenty-one, and, although tall and gawky, with tow-colored hair, a pale face and whining voice, 
he resolved to seek his fortune in New York City. Slinging his bundle of clothes on a stick over his shoulder, he walked 60 miles through the woods to Buffalo, rode on a canal boat to Albany, descended the Hudson in a barge, and reached New York just as the sun was rising, August 18, 1831. For days, Horace wandered up and down the streets, going into scores of buildings and asking if they wanted a hand. But no was the invariable reply. His quaint appearance led many to think he was an escaped apprentice. One Sunday at his boarding place, he heard that printers were wanted at West's printing office. He was at the door at five o'clock Monday morning and asked the foreman for a job at seven. The latter had no idea that the country greenhorn could set type for the polyglot testament on which help was needed, but said, fix up a case for him and we'll see if he can do anything. When the proprietor came in, he objected to the newcomer and told the foreman to let him go when his first day's work was done. That night, Horace showed a proof of the largest and most correct day's work that had then been done. In ten years, Horace was a partner in a small printing office. He founded The New Yorker, the best weekly paper in the United States, but it was not profitable. When Harrison was nominated for president in 1840, Greeley started the Log Cabin, which reached the then fabulous circulation of 90,000. But on this paper, at a penny a copy, he made no money. His next venture was the New York Tribune, price one cent. To start it, he borrowed a thousand dollars and printed five thousand copies of the first number. It was difficult to give them all away. He began with six hundred subscribers and increased the list to eleven thousand in six weeks. The demand for the Tribune grew faster than new machinery could be obtained to print it. It was a paper whose editor always tried to be right. At the World's Fair in New York in 1853, President Pierce might have been seen watching a young man exhibiting a patent rat trap. He was attracted by the enthusiasm and diligence of the young man, but never dreamed that he would become one of the richest men in the world. It seemed like small business for Jay Gould to be exhibiting a rat trap, but he did it well and with enthusiasm. In fact, he was bound to do it as well as it could be done. Young Gould supported himself by odd jobs at surveying, paying his way by erecting sundials for farmers at a dollar apiece, frequently taking his pay in board. Thus he laid the foundation for the business career in which he became so rich. Frederick Douglass started in life with less than nothing for he did not own his own body, and he was pledged before his birth to pay his master's debts. To reach the starting point of the poorest white boy, he had to climb as far as the distance which the latter must ascend if he would become President of the United States. He saw his mother but two or three times, and then in the night, when she would walk twelve miles to be with him an hour returning in time to go into the field at dawn. He had no chance to study, for he had no teacher, and the rules of the plantation forbade slaves to learn to read and write. But somehow, unnoticed by his master, he managed to learn the alphabet from scraps of paper and patent medicine almanacs, and no limits could then be placed to his career. He put to shame thousands of white boys, he fled from slavery at 21, went north and worked as a stevedore in New York and New Bedford. At Nantucket, he was given an opportunity to speak in an anti-slavery meeting and made so favorable an impression that he was made agent of the Anti-Slavery Society of Massachusetts. While traveling from place to place to lecture, he would study with all his might. He was sent to Europe to lecture and won the friendship of several Englishmen who gave him $750, with which he purchased his freedom. He edited a paper in Rochester, New York, and afterward conducted the New Era in Washington. 
For several years he was marshal of the District of Columbia. He became the first colored man in the United States, the peer of any man in the country, and died honored by all in 1895. What has been done can be done again, said the boy with no chance, who became Lord Beaconsfield, England's great prime minister. I am not a slave, I am not a captive, and by energy I can overcome greater obstacles. Jewish blood flowed in his veins, and everything seemed against him. But he remembered the example of Joseph, who became prime minister of Egypt 4,000 years before, and that of Daniel, who was prime minister to the greatest despot of the world five centuries before the birth of Christ. He pushed his way up through the lower classes, up through the middle classes, up through the upper classes, until he stood a master, self-poised upon the topmost round of political and social power. Rebuffed, scorned, ridiculed, hissed down in the House of Commons, he simply said, The time will come when you shall hear me. The time did come, and the boy with no chance but a determined will swayed the scepter of England for a quarter of a century. I learned grammar when I was a private soldier on the pay of sixpence a day, said William Cobbett. The edge of my berth, or that of the guard bed, was my seat to study in. My knapsack was my bookcase. A bit of board lying on my lap was my writing table. And the task did not demand anything like a year of my life. I had no money to purchase candles or oil. In winter, it was rarely that I could get any evening light but that of the fire, and only my turn even of that. To buy a pen or a sheet of paper, I was compelled to forego some portion of my food, though in a state of half-starvation. I had no moment of time that I could call my own, and I had to read and write amidst the talking, laughing, singing, whistling, and bawling of at least a half a score of the most thoughtless of men, and that too in the hours of their freedom from all control. Think not lightly of the farthing I had to give, now and then, for pen, ink, or paper. That farthing was, alas, a great sum to me. I was as tall as I am now, and I had great health and great exercise. The whole of the money not expended for us at market was tuppence a week for each man. I remember, and well I may, that upon one occasion I had, after all absolutely necessary expenses, on a Friday, made shift to have a halfpenny in reserve, which I had destined for the purchase of a red herring in the morning. But when I pulled off my clothes at night, so hungry then as to be hardly able to endure life, I found that I had lost my halfpenny. I buried my head under the miserable sheet and rug, and cried like a child. If I, under such circumstances, could encounter and overcome this task, he added, is there, can there be in the world, a youth to find any excuse for its non-performance? I have talked with great men, Lincoln told his fellow clerk and friend, Green, according to McClure's magazine, and I do not see how they differ from others. He made up his mind to put himself before the public, and talked of his plans to his friends. In order to keep in practice in speaking, he walked seven or eight miles to debating clubs. Practicing polemics was what he called the exercise. He seems now for the first time to have begun to study subjects. Grammar was what he chose. He sought mentor Graham, the schoolmaster, and asked his advice. If you are going before the public, Mr. Graham told him, you ought to do it. But where could he get a grammar? There was but one in the neighborhood, Mr. Graham said, and that was six miles away. Without waiting for more information, the young man rose from the breakfast table, walked immediately to the place, borrowed this rare copy of Kirkham's grammar, 
and before night was deep in its mysteries. From that time on, for weeks, he gave every moment of his leisure to mastering the contents of the book. Frequently he asked his friend Green to hold the book while he recited, and when puzzled by a point, he would consult Mr. Graham. Lincoln's eagerness to learn was such that the whole neighborhood became interested. The Greens lent him books. The schoolmaster kept him in mind and helped him as he could. And even the village cooper let him come into his shop and keep up a fire of shavings sufficiently bright to read by at night. It was not long before the grammar was mastered. Well, Lincoln said to his fellow clerk, Green, if that's what they call science, I think I'll go at another. He had made another discovery, that he could conquer subjects. The poor and friendless lad, George Peabody, weary, footsore, and hungry, called at a tavern in Concord, New Hampshire, and asked to be allowed to saw wood for lodging and breakfast. Half a century later, he called there again, but then George Peabody was one of the greatest millionaire bankers of the world. Bishop Fowler says, It is one of the greatest encouragements of our age that ordinary men with extraordinary industry reach the highest stations. Greeley's father, because the boy tried to yoke the off ox on the near side, said, Ah, that boy will never get along in the world. He'll never know enough to come in when it rains. He was too poor to wear stockings, but Horace persevered and became one of the greatest editors of his century. Handel's father hated music and would not allow a musical instrument in the house. But the boy with an aim secured a little spinet, hid it in the attic where he practiced every minute where he could steal without detection, until he surprised the great players and composers of Europe by his wonderful knowledge of music. He was very practical in his work and studied the taste and sensitiveness of audiences until he knew exactly what they wanted. Then he would compose something to supply the demand. He analyzed the effect of sounds and combinations of sounds upon the senses and wrote directly to human needs. His greatest work, The Messiah, was composed in Dublin for the benefit of poor debtors who were imprisoned there. The influence of this masterpiece was tremendous. It was said it outpreached the preacher, outprayed prayers, reformed the wayward, softened stony hearts, as it told the wonderful story of redemption in sound. A. T. Stewart began life as a teacher in New York at $300 a year. He soon resigned and began that career as a merchant in which he achieved a success almost without precedent. Honesty, one price, cash on delivery, and business on business principles were his invariable rules. Absolute regularity and system reigned in every department. In 50 years he made a fortune of from 30 to 40 million dollars. He was nominated as Secretary of the Treasury in 1869, but it was found that the law forbids a merchant to occupy that position. He offered to resign or to give the entire profits of his business to the poor of New York as long as he should remain in office. President Grant declined to accept such an offer. Poor Kepler struggled with constant anxieties and told fortunes by astrology for a livelihood, saying that astrology as the daughter of astronomy ought to keep her mother. But fancy a man of science wasting precious time over horoscopes. I supplicate you, he writes to Meslin, if there is a situation vacant at Tubingen, do what you can to obtain it for me, and let me know the prices of bread and wine and other necessaries of life, for my wife is not accustomed to live on beans. He had to accept all sorts of jobs. He made almanacs and served anyone who would pay him. Who would have predicted that the modest, gentle boy, Raphael, without either riches or noted family, 
would have worked his way to such renown, or that one of his pictures, but sixty-six and three-quarter inches square, the mother of Jesus, would be sold to the Empress of Russia for sixty-six thousand dollars. His Ansidai Madonna was bought by the National Gallery for three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Think of Michelangelo working for six florins a month and eighteen years on St. Peter's for nothing. Dr. Johnson was so afflicted with King's evil that he lost the use of one eye. The youth could not even engage in the pastimes of his mates, as he could not see the gutter without bending his head down near the street. He read and studied terribly. Finally a friend offered to send him to Oxford, but he failed to keep his promise, and the boy had to leave. He returned home, and soon afterward his father died insolvent. He conquered adverse fortune and bodily infirmities with the fortitude of a true hero. Ichabod Washburn, a poor boy born near Plymouth Rock, was apprenticed to a blacksmith in Worcester, Mass, and was so bashful that he scarcely dared to eat in the presence of others. But he determined that he would make the best wire in the world, and would contrive ways and means to manufacture it in enormous quantities. At that time there was no good wire made in the United States. One house in England had the monopoly of making steel wire for pianos for more than a century. Young Washburn, however, had grit and was bound to succeed. His wire became the standard everywhere. At one time he made 250,000 yards of iron wire daily, consuming 12 tons of metal and requiring the services of 700 men. He amassed an immense fortune, of which he gave away a large part during his life, and bequeathed the balance to charitable institutions. John Jacob Astor left home at seventeen to acquire a fortune. His capital consisted of two dollars and three resolutions, to be honest, to be industrious, and not to gamble. Two years later, he reached New York and began work in a fur store at two dollars a week and his board. Soon learning the details of the business, he began operations on his own account. By giving personal attention to every purchase and sale, roaming the woods to trade with the Indians, or crossing the Atlantic to sell his furs at a great profit in England, he soon became the leading fur dealer in the United States. His idea of what constitutes a fortune expanded faster than his acquisitions. At fifty, he owned millions. At sixty, his millions owned him. He invested in land, becoming in time the richest owner of real estate in America. Generous to his family, he seldom gave much for charity. He once subscribed fifty dollars for some benevolent purpose, when one of the committee of solicitation said, We did hope for more, Mr. Astor. Your son gave us a hundred dollars. Ah, chuckled the rich furrier. William has a rich father. Mine was poor. Elihu Burritt wrote in a diary kept at Wooster, whither he went to enjoy its library privileges. Such entries as these. Monday, June 18. Headache. Forty pages, Cuvier's Theory of the Earth. Sixty-four pages of French. 11 hours forging. Tuesday, June 19, 60 lines Hebrew, 30 Danish, 10 lines Bohemian, 9 lines Polish, 15 names of stars, 10 hours forging. Wednesday, June 20, 25 lines Hebrew, 8 lines Syriac, 11 hours forging. He mastered 8 languages and 32 dialects. He became eminent as the learned blacksmith, and for his noble work in the service of humanity. Edward Everett said of the manner in which this boy with no chance acquired great learning, it is enough to make one who has had good opportunities for education hang his head in shame. 
I was born in poverty, said Vice President Henry Wilson. Want sat by my cradle. I know what it is to ask a mother for bread when she has none to give. I left my home at ten years of age and served an apprenticeship of eleven years, receiving a month's schooling each year. And at the end of eleven years of hard work, a yoke of oxen and six sheep which brought me $84. I never spent the sum of one dollar for pleasure, counting every penny from the time I was born till I was 21 years of age. I know what it is to travel weary miles and ask my fellow men to give me leave to toil. In the first month after I was 21 years of age, I went into the woods, drove a team and cut mill logs. I rose in the morning before daylight and worked hard till after dark, and received the magnificent sum of six dollars for the month's work. Each of these dollars looked as large to me as the moon looks tonight. Many a farmer's son, says Thurlow Weed, has found the best opportunities for mental improvement in his intervals of leisure while tending sap bush. Such, at any rate, was my own experience. At night, you had only to feed the kettles and keep up the fires, the sap having been gathered and the wood cut before dark. During the day, we would always lay in a good stock of fat pine, by the light of which, blazing bright before the sugar house, in the posture the serpent was condemned to assume, as a penalty for tempting our first grandmother. I passed many a delightful night in reading, I remember in this way to have read a history of the French Revolution, and to have obtained from it a better and more enduring knowledge of its events and horrors, and of the actors in that great national tragedy, than I have received from all subsequent reading. I remember also how happy I was in being able to borrow the books of a Mr. Keyes, after a two-mile tramp through the snow, shoeless, my feet swaddled, remnants of rag carpet. That fellow will beat us all some day, said a merchant speaking of John Wanamaker and his close attention to his work. What a prediction to make of a young man who started business with a little clothing in a handcart in the streets of Philadelphia. But this youth had the indomitable spirit of a conqueror in him, and you could not keep him down. General Grant said to George W. Childs, Mr. Wanamaker could command an army. His great energy, method, industry, economy, and high moral principle attracted President Harrison, who appointed him Postmaster General. Jacques Aristide Boussicot began his business life as an employee in a dry goods house in a small provincial town in France. After a few years, he went to Paris, where he prospered so rapidly that in 1853 he became a partner and later the sole proprietor of the Bon Marché, then only a small shop, which became under his direction the most unique establishment in the world. His idea was to establish a combined philanthropic and commercial house on a large scale. Everyone who worked for him was advanced progressively, according to his length of employment and the value of the services he rendered. He furnished free tuition, free medical attendance, and a free library for employees, a provident fund affording a small capital for males and a marriage portion for females at the expiration of 10 or 15 years of service, a free reading room for the public, and a free art gallery for artists to exhibit their paintings or sculptures. After his sudden death in 1877, his only son carried forward his father's projects until he too died in 1879, when his widow, Marguerite Guerin, continued and extended his business and beneficent plans until her death in 1887. So well did this family lay the foundations of a building covering 108,000 square feet, with many accessory buildings of smaller size, 
and of a business employing 3,600 persons, with sales amounting to nearly $20 million annually, that every department is still conducted with all its former success in accordance with the instructions of the founders. They are here no longer in their bodily presence, but their spirit, their ideas still pervade the vast establishment. Everything is still sold at a small profit and at a price plainly marked, and any article which may have ceased to please the purchaser can, without the slightest difficulty, be exchanged or its value refunded. When James Gordon Bennett was 40 years old, he collected all his property, $300, and in a cellar with a board upon two barrels for a desk, himself his own typesetter, office boy, publisher, newsboy, clerk, editor, proofreader, and printer's devil, he started the New York Herald. In all his literary work up to this time, he had tried to imitate Franklin's style, and, as is the fate of all imitators, he utterly failed. He lost twenty years of his life trying to be somebody else. He first showed the material he was made of in the salutatory of the Herald, viz. Our only guide shall be good, sound, and practical common sense, applicable to the business and bosoms of men engaged in everyday life. We shall support no party, be the organ of no faction or coterie, and care nothing for any election or any candidate, from president down to constable. We shall endeavor to record facts upon every public and proper subject stripped of verbiage and coloring, with comments when suitable, just, independent, fearless, and good-tempered. Joseph Hunter was a carpenter, Robert Burns a plowman, Keats a druggist, Thomas Carlyle a mason, Hugh Miller a stonemason, Rubens the artist was a page, Swedenborg a mining engineer, Dante and Descartes were soldiers, Ben Johnson was a bricklayer and worked at building Lincoln Inn in London with trowel in hand and a book in his pocket. Jeremy Taylor was a barber. Andrew Johnson was a tailor. Cardinal Wolsey was a butcher's son. So were Defoe and Kirk White. Michael Faraday was the son of a blacksmith. He even excelled his teacher, Sir Humphrey Davy, who was an apprentice to an apothecary. Virgil was the son of a porter, Homer of a farmer, Pope of a merchant, Horace of a shopkeeper, Demosthenes of a cutler, Milton of a money scrivener, Shakespeare of a wool stapler, and Oliver Cromwell of a brewer. John Wanamaker's first salary was $1.25 per week. A.T. Stewart began his business life as a school teacher. James Keene drove a milk wagon in a California town. Joseph Pulitzer, proprietor of the New York World, once acted as a stoker on a Mississippi steamboat. When a young man, Cyrus Field was a clerk in a New England store. George W. Childs was an errand boy for a bookseller at $4 a month. Andrew Carnegie began work in a Pittsburgh telegraph office at $3 a week. C.P. Huntington sold butter and eggs for what he could get, a pound or dozen. Whitelaw Reed was once a correspondent of a newspaper in Cincinnati at $5 per week. Adam Forepaw was once a butcher in Philadelphia. Sarah Bernhardt was a dressmaker's apprentice. Adelaide Nielsen began life as a child's nurse. Miss Braddon, the novelist, was a utility actress in the provinces. Charlotte Cushman was the daughter of poor people. Mr. W. O. Stoddard, in his Men of Business, tells a characteristic story of the late Leland Stanford. When 18 years of age, his father purchased a tract of woodland, but had not the means to clear it as he wished. He told Leland that he could have all he could make from the timber 
if he would leave the land clear of trees. A new market had just then been created for cordwood, and Leland took some money that he had saved, hired other choppers to help him, and sold over 2,000 cords of wood to the Mohawk and Hudson River Railroad at a net profit of $2,600. He used this sum to start him in his law studies, and thus, as Mr. Stoddard says, chopped his way to the bar. It is said that the career of Benjamin Franklin is full of inspiration for any young man. When he left school for good, he was only 12 years of age. At first, he did little but read. He soon found, however, that reading alone would not make him an educated man, and he proceeded to act upon this discovery at once. At school he had been unable to understand arithmetic. Twice he had given it up as a hopeless puzzle, and finally left school almost hopelessly ignorant upon the subject. But the printer's boy soon found his ignorance of figures extremely inconvenient. When he was about fourteen, he took up for the third time the Cocker's Arithmetic, which had baffled him at school, and ciphered all through it with ease and pleasure. He then mastered a work upon navigation, which included the rudiments of geometry, and thus tasted, quote, the inexhaustible charm of mathematics, unquote. He pursued a similar course, we are told, in acquiring the art of composition, in which, at length, he excelled most of the men of his time. When he was but a boy of sixteen, he wrote so well that the pieces which he slyly sent to his brother's paper were thought to have been written by some of the most learned men in the colony. Henry Clay, the mill boy of the Slashes, was one of seven children of a widow too poor to send him to any but a common country school, where he was drilled only in the three R's. But he used every spare moment to study without a teacher, and in after years he was a king among self-made men. The most successful man is he who has triumphed over obstacles, disadvantages, and discouragements. It is Goodyear in his rude laboratory, enduring poverty and failure until the pasty rubber is at length hardened. It is Edison biding his time in baggage car and in printing office until that mysterious light and power glows and throbs at his command. It is Carey on his cobbler's bench, nourishing the great purpose that at length carried the message of love to benighted India. These are the cases and examples of true success. End of chapter 3 <laughs>